Hello to all of our loyal viewers. Welcome back to Math 141 Summer 2020. We are here live with episode two. All my E to the X's live in Texas. I was quite proud of that title. I thought about it for probably a good three minutes before settling on that one. Today, we are going to talk about some of your problems from sections 1.5 and 1.6, which cover and introduce exponential functions. This is perhaps the single most important function in mathematics, the exponential function. So I'm glad that we get to be introduced to it today. Um, he's a popular guy. He has lots of friends, and he's made a few new ones today in you all. Section 1.6 then talks about inverse functions and logarithms, um, which is really cool as well, how we can kind of undo functions in certain cases. Um, the joke that I was going to make that I'm going to make regarding inverse functions and logarithms is that, remember kids, you can't undo sex, but you can undo e to the x, okay? So keep that in mind. That's what logarithms are all about. But before we get started with that stuff, I did get a request um, to, to do one problem from the previous homework, the 1.1 through 1.3 homework. I don't have the number, um, but I... Um, I don't have the problem number in front of me, but I know what the problem is, and I thought about doing it in the previous video, but ultimately decided against it in the interest of time. So I'm glad that someone else asked, because this is a good problem. So the problem here asks us to express the area and perimeter, perimeter of an equilateral triangle of an equi, I'm gonna abbreviate here, equilateral is what that means, triangle, as a function, function of the triangle side length, I'm just gonna write of side length, which we're calling x. Okay, so we don't know exactly what the side length is. The point is that we can actually write a general function, which will work no matter what the side length is. Okay. So that is the problem which we have been given, our task. If we choose to accept it, I do accept it on behalf of all of us. So the first thing that I'm gonna do, let's just sketch our picture real quick. Oh boy, goodness gracious, all was good until right around um, until right around here, that angle's a little iffy. But nonetheless, so we have our equilateral triangle here, pretend it's equilateral and pretend it's a triangle, with side lengths x, 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 okay. Um, now the other nice thing that we know about equilateral triangles, we know the side length and we also know that these angles, so this is 60 degrees, 60 degrees, and 60 degrees. That's going to come in handy in a little bit. We don't usually use degrees in this class in, in calculus. You can pretty much say goodbye to degrees. Um, I hope that, um, you're, you're fairly comfortable with radians and if not, I encourage you to get comfortable because you're going to be using those a lot. But we will write this in degrees for now because that's how we've traditionally seen our triangles. Um, so anyways, this is our equilateral triangle. I think we can start with the perimeter and I think the perimeter formula won't be so bad. So the perimeter, <clears throat> I'm gonna write this to mean perimeter. This function is gonna be our perimeter function. I'm gonna call it capital P, perimeter. And it's a function of X, right? So that's why we have our X in here perimeter function of x. Well, the perimeter, you'll recall, from geometry, that's just the sum of, that's just the, the sum of the length of all the sides. So in this case, I think it's fairly straightforward to see that, well, the sum of all the side lengths is just x plus x plus x. And most people write that as 3x. Okay. So that gives us our perimeter function. That one's not so bad. That one's pretty straightforward. It's the area function, which is gonna be a bit trickier. So let's go ahead and set that up. So in general, so generally for a right for an for a, a triangle, you will recall that area is equal to base times height, right? Hopefully, oh, excuse me, times one half, put all that over two. Heavens, good Lord, I promise I have a bachelor's in math. Um, 
<laughs> so this is the area formula for a triangle, base times height over two. So we must find base and height. Must find base and height. Okay, well, the base, I don't think the base is gonna be so bad. Because if we just look at our picture here, the base is just, let me redraw our picture actually, because we're gonna want a bigger one that we can toy with a little bit. So I'm gonna make a big picture down here. Big triangle, X, 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 okay. Well, the, the length of the base, that's pretty clearly just X. That's just the length of this side here. So this is our base. So that is X. Okay, so base equals X. The height, that is going to be a bit trickier. The height is gonna be this measure here. It's gonna be the length of this thing. So I'll call that H, right? It's gonna be the length of this perpendicular from the tippy top of our triangle down to the middle of the base. And we somehow have to figure out what this height is. Well, one thing that we love in mathematics, oh my goodness, we love it so much, right angles. And that's exactly what we have here, a nice right angle. So I've got this nice right triangle here, which goes, which goes like, well, yeah, I'll just, it goes like this down to over here in this corner and then up here. And so this is our right triangle. We have that the hypotenuse length is X. And this is where, you'll recall, this is gonna come in handy. Down here, this angle is 60 degrees, right? Because that's just one of our angles of our big triangle. And what is, well, actually at this point, we're already done. In fact, we do know, well, I'm, when I say we're done, I mean, we have enough information. But I'll also mention, we also know this side length as well. So this side length is just X over two because the length of the entire base of our big triangles is X, and we're just taking half of it. So this little guy right here is X over two. Okay. So now we can use a little bit of trigonometry. And in particular, if I look at this angle, look at our 60 degree angle here. I realize whenever I say here, you can't really see where I'm pointing. If we look here at this angle, well, so Katoa, tells us that in particular, so tells us that sine of 60 degrees is equal to opposite, which is H in this case, because that's opposite of our 60 degree angle over hypotenuse, and hypotenuse is X, right? Okay, well now I'm gonna convert from degrees to radians. So 60 degrees, that is pi over three radians. I'm not gonna go through much of an X. I'm not gonna really explain that here, but that is something converting between angles, degrees and radians um, is another thing which you're gonna want to be fairly comfortable with. So I would be glad to talk about that more some other time if people would like. Um, but that is certainly something that you're gonna wanna spend some time getting comfortable with if you're not already there. In any case, so now we have sine of pi over three equals h over x. And I'm gonna go ahead, just because I don't need you to save some space, goodbye x. <laughs> goodbye to all my x's who live in Texas, okay. Well, sine of pi over three, we know, or we are working on memorizing, right? That that is root three over two. So then root three over two equals that height over x multiply both sides by x, and I have x root three over two equals h. <clears throat> all right. So all that we did here was like we took our big picture and we broke it down into the smaller triangle here, the smaller triangle, and we used a bit of trigonometry. Okay, so now I know that my area is base times height over two. <clears throat> we just found that the base was X and the height was X root three over two, which means that my area formula 
is going to be base is x. I'll write it this way, right? One half times x times my height, which is x root 3 over 2. Okay. And I can simplify this if I want. Combine these denominators into a 4. And then I've got x squared root 3, it looks like, on top. I just did a little bit of algebra there. Um, but that gives us our area formula. x squared root 3 over 4. How yummy. How cute is that? Aw, how cute. Little heart. Okay. So I hope that clears up this problem. Um, I imagine... I only got one person who requested it, but I wouldn't be surprised if other people found this one difficult. This is a challenging problem for sure. But when we draw pictures, even if they're not beautiful pictures, um, even if they're not beautiful pictures, they do still convey the important information and get us what we need. All right. If you haven't already, you are going to probably continue. If you haven't already, you are probably going to fall in love with right angles. Um, we, we in mathematics love our right triangles. Okay, so that's enough for the 1.1, 1 1.3, at least for now. Let's jump into the 1.5 through 1.6 homework. And I have a number of problems lined up from there, which I think are going to be uh, beneficial. I've tried to pick problems from a variety of topics in this section, so we'll see how I did. Okay, so problem eight is the first one that I want to do. Problem eight looks like find, it actually looks kind of similar to a 1.1 through 1.3 problem. However, it does involve exponential functions. So I think it's good to do this one to get a bit more comfortable with exponential functions. For the function, this time they're calling it g, so g of t, the square root of 25 plus 8 to the negative t. OK, so first of all, let's try and find our domain. Seems like a good starting point. So again, as we've talked about before, the domain, remember, that's going to be all legal. I'm going to say legal. You know what I mean by that, I hope. T values that we can plug in. And so my question to you is, are there any T values that are illegal here? To answer that question, you'll have to remember so remember that 8 to the negative t, this means 1 over 8 to the t. OK, so that might be easier to think about for you. Um, you'll see this notation a lot. So again, this is notation you're going to want to get comfortable with, this, these negative exponents. I'm not sure how familiar you are with those, how, how much you've seen those in the past. But in any case, what we notice is that 1 over 8 to the t is always going to be positive, right? It might get very, 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 very small, but it's always going to be positive. It could be huge. It could be tiny. I don't know. With this radical here, the only thing that we need to worry about is not having... Um, what, what's the word I'm is not having what's under the radical be smaller than zero. And since one over eight to the t is always greater than zero, so greater than zero for all t, that's an r, for all t, 25 plus eight to the negative t is also going to be, so 25 plus eight to the negative t is going to be greater than zero for all t. So we have no problems anywhere. So our domain is the entire real number line, negative infinity to infinity. Basically, the point is, remember, whenever we're trying to find the domain, usually we're actually looking for, OK, rather than looking for where we can legally plug stuff in, 
we're really trying to find if there are any places where we can where we can't plug stuff in legally. In this time, there are no such values. Now let's look at the range. Range, I think, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. This is my first time using it, well, second time from the first video, but today is the first day I've used one of these bad boys, so. Okay, so the range, remember, so that's gonna be all possible outputs, all possible outputs. And here is what we notice here. So 25, so we, we said that 20, we, ugh. so eight to the negative T is always greater than zero, we said. Again, it could be very small, but it's always certainly going to be greater than zero for all T. So that means that 25 plus eight to the minus T is always bigger than 25. You can think about this intuitively or just think about, start. I started from here. I started from eight to the negative t greater than zero and I added 25 to both sides. Well, since this is true, this means that, uh, what do we call our function? That g of t, well remember g of t is just the square root of that, square root of 25 plus eight to the negative t. That means that that is always greater than the square root of 25. That's a five. <laughs> and square root of 25, this is just five. So the range, it's not going to be all real numbers because we'll always, we're always going to be bigger than five because of this but we can then get as big as we want. So our range is going to be five to infinity. Note that we are not including that endpoint of five. That's because eight to the negative t is always strictly greater than zero, right? Strictly greater than, I almost underlined it, but then it would look like I said less greater than or equal to. Okay, this is always strictly greater than zero, which means that our, that g of t will always be strictly greater than five. Okay, so again, I think one of the big takeaways from this one is just continuing to get comfortable with this fact here, that eight to the negative T is just one over eight to the T. Okay, again, maybe you've seen that before and maybe you're comfortable with it, or maybe it's something you're still trying to get comfortable with. That does it for problem eight. Next, I am would like to jump to problem 19. I like this homework set. There are a lot of problems um, of a lot of different varieties. Ooh, yes, finding inverse functions. Okay, so we're given uh, that f of x equals x plus three over x minus seven. All right, so we're given this function and we are told a few things. So I'll write them, I'll call them A, B, C, D, whatever, but they're not actually called that on the, the problem. So find F inverse of X. Okay, so that's the first thing we're gonna do. After that, we're going to find the domain of f inverse of x. Third, we will find the range of f inverse of x. And actually, I'm gonna throw this in, I should have put this in here. So I'll, I'll call this a.5, which I know makes no sense. Um, check your answer, so check the inverse as in make sure that it truly is f, that it truly is the inverse of f. And I'll explain how to do that and we'll go through it. And the problem, this is listed at the end, but really I think that this check f inverse is listed at the end, but I really think you should probably do that as soon as you find your inverse function to make sure that you're right. Okay, here we go. So let's start off with a. 
So we're going to find f inverse of x. So the way that we do this, in general, the book gives us as two different steps, but I just do it as one step. Um, we're going to write y equals, or excuse me. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this instead of f of x equals x plus 3 over 7, over x minus 7. I'm going to write this as x equals y plus 3 over y minus 7. Okay, so I'm just going to replace all the x's with y's. Okay. And then replace my y. Usually, you here we have f of x equals this, but we could really write y equals that, and it would be the same thing. And then we're going to solve for y. Okay, so we're, we replaced, we basically swapped the x's and y's, and now we're just going to do a little bit of algebra to solve for y. All right, so let me see. First things first, let's multiply this y minus 7 over to get x times y minus 7 equals y plus 3. Okay, and now I can, let me distribute the x, so xy minus 7x equals y plus 3. Okay, let me subtract, now let's get all my y's on the same side, so let me do xy minus y equals 7x plus 3. Just subtract it over a y, add it over 7x, and now... On my left, let's factor out a y to be left with x minus 1, 7x plus 3. And finally, dividing both sides by x minus 1 gives us y equals 7x plus 3 over x minus 1. I hope I didn't go through that too fast. The great thing about YouTube, I suppose, is that you can pause it as you need to. Um, but this is basically just algebra like we've done before. All right. So this is our inverse function. So let me write um, inverse is f inverse of x. This negative 1 here is not an exponent. Remember, this is just f inverse of x is what that means. Equals 7x plus 3 over x minus 1. And that gives us our inverse function. Let's go to, is that my, no, let's not do that color. Let's use a nice orange like I used for the title. That's Gettysburg College orange, not uh, Clemson orange, don't worry. Okay, so let's do 8.5, which is a made-up number, which I made up. And so we are going to check our inverse. And the way that you do that, so you want f of f inverse of x to be equal to x. This is what we need to show. Okay. This is the big equation that we need. What this means is that my func is that if I plug, what this means is that if I do f inverse and then I do f, then I get right back where I started. Okay, we also need to show in the same vein, so actually let me erase this period because I'm not quite done, and I need to show that it, why is that yellow? Oh my lord. Okay, still playing with this new toy. Um, and we have to show the other way as well that f inverse of f of x equals x. I'll just show one way um, in the interest of time. But you can do the others, but you can, um, in fact, I'll leave both of these to you to check. Um, these are just straightforward function composition like we did in the last section. Okay, But this, this isn't special to this problem. We can always check an inverse this way. So we can always check an inverse this way. Okay, so this is a great thing. You'll probably hear me talk a lot about how one of my favorite things about math is that we can check our answer so much of the time. 
And this is yet another instance of that. Okay. So let's move on to part B. What color to use? We'll use black this time. So part B, this asks us to find the domain of F inverse. So find domain of F inverse of X. And we just said that F inverse of X, that's the same thing as seven X plus three over X minus one. Okay, so this is what we want to do. We want to find the domain of this function. Well, you'll recall. So the question is what x can we legally plug in? Well, a better question is perhaps what x can we not legally plug in? And that answer is simply x equals 1. Because then we are dividing by 0, right? You see here, if x equals 1, then this denominator is 0. I don't see any other possible problems arising with this function. Aside from dividing by 0, there's really nothing else that can go wrong here. So the domain is going to be everything except for 1. So we're going to go all the way from negative infinity up to 1. We're going to just jump over 1 and then go on to infinity. That's a u. u, u. Ta-da! And that is our domain. Okay, so again, only one really problem that we needed to look out for there. Next up, we have the range. Okay, so let's find the range of this bad boy or woman. I don't want to discriminate. Range. Okay. So the range, I should say, if I have inverse of x. And this brings us to a fabulous little trick because as I think you might have seen in the previous video, as I hope you might have picked up on, finding the range can sometimes be a bit tricky. Right? Last time that we'd found the range of something, something we had to draw a picture and we had to do some calculations. Sometimes it's a lot easier to find the domain. So that brings us to the cute trick here. The domain of f inverse of x, I'll say that the domain of f of x is the range of f inverse of x and vice versa. Box that up, put a star around it. The domain of f of x is the range of f inverse of x, and it goes the other way as well. Okay, so I don't know why I capitalized domain and not range. I like them both equally, so I didn't mean to pick on one of them. Okay. So this is a key observation, and this goes right back to this, how we wanted to check our inverse because f and f inverse just undo each other. So with that in mind, we just need to find, so we just need the domain of f of x, right? We're looking for the range of f inverse so all that we need to do is find the domain of f. Well, if we go back to f, our function f looks like this, x plus 3 over x minus 7. 
And just like we found the domain of f inverse of x a moment ago, we can see here that the domain of f of x is going to be everything except for 7. Let me go back up. Because if I plug in 7, then I'm dividing by 0, and everything breaks. OK. So that domain is going to be negative infinity to 7, union with 7 up to infinity. Again, we're just going to jump right on over 7. We're not including it. I'm sorry, 7. 7 is like Rudolph, never included in any of the reindeer games. Poor little guy. I'm sure we will include him in another interval later on. In fact, 7 was included in the domain of f inverse, so we're not totally excluding 7. We still love you, 7. Okay, so we still, we still love you, 7. There, we drew a little heart. Okay, so let's review this problem. First, to find f inverse of x, all that we did was we swapped the x's and the y's. So swap x and y. And then we solved for y from there. Okay, so we just did some algebra. And we solved for y. And that gave us our inverse. To check our inverse, you check that the function which you came up with, which we call f, which we called f inverse, we check that that function composed with f gives us x spit. So if you plug in x, then it spits x back out. Right? That all this is saying is that this thing eats x and it spits x back out. And same thing for the other direction. Okay. And then we just found the domain like we normally would. And then we use the cute fact that the range and domain of inverse functions just flip flop each other, which is a great trick um, in situations such as this one, where we had a domain which was easier to find than a range. And then we expressed our love for seven. Wonderful. OK, that brings us to the next one. The next one that I want to do is number 20. So we're not going to jump very far this time. Number 20. OK, let me pull that up. Yes, I want to move on to the next problem. Oh, so now we're going to get into some natural log stuff. So what we're going to do here is express ln of 0 0.125 in terms of ln2 and or ln3. OK, so we're going to use some of our logarithm tricks to rewrite ln of, one, LN of 0 0.125 in terms of these other guys. And there's a key observation that we need to make here. OK. The key observation, so the key is that 0 0.125 is 1 eighth. Okay, this is the big key to this problem. There's still more work to do. But once you have this, everything else, um, if you don't have this, I should say, it's going to be impossible to see how these other things, these ln2 and ln3, might come in handy. Why is this so helpful, getting 1 eighth? Well, the nice thing about 8 is that 8 is just 2 cubed. OK? And 1 over 2 cubed, that is just 2 to the negative 3. OK, so again, we're going to use those negative exponents. This is an example of a time where writing a negative exponent actually makes our life a little bit easier. OK, so now I have ln of 0 0.125 is equal to ln of 2 to the negative 3, right? Simply because negative, or 0 0.125 is equal to 2 to the negative 3. So now we're going to use the following fact 
that if I have ln of a to the b in general, what I can do is I can bring that b out front and write it like so. So ln of a to the b becomes b to the ln of a. So what I'm doing really is I'm just bringing this b out front. So if we jump back up to this pro to the ln of 2 to the negative 3, this becomes negative 3 ln of 2. And just like that, we have something in terms of ln 2 and or ln 3. In this case, there is no ln of 3, just ln of 2. But that is all that we needed. All right? So again, the key observation here was that we, we could write 0 0.125. So we can write 0 0.125 as a power of 2. A power of 2. That was the key. That's why this 0 0.125 was special. All right, and then from there, we just used our new fun logarithm toy. Logarithms are another thing which I think probably are a little bit scary at first and probably not your favorite thing right away. They certainly weren't my favorite thing whenever I first learned them. However, you come to love them. Um, <laughs> I certainly hope that you come to love them anyways, as like it or not, they are not going anywhere and you will see them throughout the remainder of your mathematical career. So if you don't love them already, I encourage you to take some time, practice, and learn to love them. Ooh, okay. We're gonna do another one in case, um, to help us work on finding our love for logarithms. So here, we are told to simplify, and we have the expression ln of cosine of theta minus ln of cosine of theta over three. Yummy, I love it whenever we have functions inside of functions here, about cosine sitting inside ln, functions inside of functions. Wow, functionception, holy moly. So here, we are actually going to do, there are two ways of doing this, in fact. So why don't we do both of them? I did it one way, so we'll start with that. Way one. So way one uses the observation that, let me write this in a different color, because this is a general rule here. So let me write this one in green, this one says ln of a minus ln of b equals ln of a over b. Okay, natural logs have so many cute little rules like this. That's one, if you're looking for reasons to love them, take that as one. So many cute little rules. So, using this information, our expression becomes ln of Cosine theta over, so cosine theta plays the role of A here. And then B is going to be cosine theta over three. Cosine theta over three. Oh my goodness. Fractionception now. Now I've got fraction and functionception because look, I've got this fraction here and the denominator of this other fraction. Well, I don't know about you, but I think that it is easier to multiply by the reciprocal than to divide by another fraction. Okay, so instead of dividing by cosine of theta over three, I can multiply by the reciprocal. Okay, so I hope that's familiar as well. I'll make a note of it just in case it's not. So a over b over c, well that's the same as a times c over b. Okay, again, in other words, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. 
And now this is very nice because look at this, cosine theta here, cosine theta here, they cancel. And so we are just left with ln of three. And I would say that's pretty simple. I don't think we're gonna be able to simplify any more than that. So this was how I originally did it. And there's nothing wrong with it, of course. It's nice and cute, only a couple of lines. It gets the job done. But actually, just a moment ago, I saw another cute way of doing it. So why don't we do way two now? And here, we are again going to use the same rule. Okay, so we're again going to use, I'll, I'll, chop, I'll copy it down here, ln a, ln a minus ln b equals ln a over b. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so I'm going to start with just my ln of cosine theta. Okay, so let's ln of cosine theta. And now I'm going to break up this part, the second ln, and I'm going to write minus ln of cosine theta minus ln of 3, right? All that I did is I used this rule where a was cosine theta and b was 3, right? So actually I went from, from the right-hand side from here to the other side. Okay, and now we have to be a little bit careful in doing this because I need to distribute this negative sign. So now I have minus ln cosine theta, and now I have minus minus, so I have a plus plus ln three, and my two lns here, they cancel each other out, and so I just get ln of three, which is the same thing that we got up here. So that makes us happy and we smile. Yay, we got it. All right, so two different ways of doing it. Each way, perfectly acceptable. You'll see we're basically using the same rules and, and really it's just a matter of which rule are we using first. But in any case, that gives us our solution one way or another. Just like in life and math, there's always so many more than one correct way of doing things. Okay, now unlike in, unlike in math and life, there are many more correct answers. <laughs> there, both of these ways only had one correct answer. But anyways, I can only take the metaphor so far. Next up, problem 24. This is another natural log problem. I figured it was good to do a few of these because I know for me, as I said a few minutes ago, um, this was certainly something that I found challenging. Solve for y in term, and truthfully, I still find it challenging. Um, I still groan a little bit whenever I see natural logs in my problems that I solve, so. We are given ln of y minus six minus ln six equals x plus ln x. And we must solve for y. And this is where we are going to use, oh, well, let me see. There are a couple of facts which we're going to use here. So fact one, whoops. So the first fact that we're gonna use is that e to the ln of x is equal to just x. So the e and the natural log here cancel each other out. So that's the first fact which is gonna come in handy. And this works for any x. In fact, let me replace that x with another variable just so that we're clear that I don't mean only in this case. That is always true ln of a equals a, for any a. The second fact, and this is just a fact of exponents, if I have a to the b times a to the c, 
um, that is just a to the b plus c. Okay, so whenever I'm multiplying things, the, the important part here is that I have the same base. So I have a, 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 right? So I have the same base here. This does not work if they're, if they're different bases. But as long as it's the same base, we add the exponents like this. So jumping back to our original problem, the, the first step which I'm going to do is I am going to use our logarithm rules, the ones that we used just a second ago, to rewrite the left-hand side as ln of y minus 6 over 6. Okay, and This is that logarithm rule we were using a moment ago. And then on the right-hand side, x plus ln of x. Now I am going to use fact 1 Okay, so I'm going to use this cancellation of e and ln. If I raise e to both sides of this, so if I, yeah, so e to the ln y minus 6 over 6 equals e to the x plus ln of x, then, well, actually, I suppose I haven't really used 1 yet. Now I'm going to use 1. This left-hand side now is just y minus 6 over 6 because the e and the ln cancel. And the left-hand side, well, now I'm going to use 2 over here, excuse me, the right-hand side, to get e to the x, e to the ln of x. Right? So actually, we went from the right-hand side of up here to the left-hand side. Right? We said a to the x a to the b plus c, b plus c is equal to a to the b times a to the c. Well, Bailey, why the heck did you do that? How did that get us anywhere on the right-hand side? Well, now, using number 1 again, e to the ln of x is just x. Right? Again, the e and the natural log are just canceling. From here, it's pretty much just straightforward algebra like we've been doing since high school. If I multiply both sides by 6, then I get y minus 6 equals 6x e to the x. Then I add 6 to both sides, and I get y equals 6x e to the x plus 6. And I have my solution. All right, so these were two important facts which we used here. They're very important ones that you're going to want to be able to use and get comfortable with. Um, your exponent rules um, would be good to review. I'm not sure if you've seen them before. I would imagine that most of you have at least seen them before. So I encourage you to get as comfortable with them as you can because they will become very relevant as you can see here, this is another thing that throughout calculus and throughout your mathematical career, wherever it may take you, those exponent rules are going to come in handy. So those are good to go ahead and try and memorize. Okay. And same thing with this relationship between E and the natural log. Um, we have all kinds of little tricks, right? Like if I have x plus 6 equals 2, well, to get rid of the plus 6, I subtract 6, right? Subtract 6 minus 6, and I get x equals, neg equals negative 4, right? So we have a little trick to eliminate the plus 6. The e and the natural log, they are doing the same thing here. We use, just like we added, we subtracted 6 there, here we raise things to the e. We raise e to the respective powers, and things cancel, okay? So it's just another little algebraic trick um, to put in your tool belt. All right, so let's, see, let's keep going. I'd like to get through two more and I wanna keep this at about an hour. Um, let's start with 28. 28, I think, is one which 
looks really scary because you're using the scary new notation. However, it's actually not so bad. So that's why I wanna, um, so that is why I wanna go through it to help us see that, okay, wait a minute, maybe this isn't so bad. Um, give me just a second, okay. So 28 asks us for, so find exact value of cos cosine inverse to the negative one half. All right, so this is what we want. So really what this is asking for, this is really just a matter of getting comfortable with this notation. So cosine inverse of x, what this means is where in the interval, um, where in the interval zero to pi is cosine theta equal to x. That's what this is asking. So where in this interval is cosine equal to this particular value? So in our problem, we're asking, so where, let me, so cosine, arc cosine, negative one half, you'll usually hear this red arc cos, and you'll oftentimes see it written that way as well. Usually that's how I write it, but here I'm gonna stick with the book notation or excuse me, the, the homework problem notation, also the book notation. So this is just asking where in the interval from zero to pi is cosine theta equal to negative one half. And so this is really just the question of, do you know your unit circle, right? The, 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 the tricky part of this question is, can you understand this notation? Once you understand that notation, it really is just a, um, a unit circle problem, and we find that this is equal to two pi over three. All right, <laughs> I, I sound like a broken record, I know. A lot of these functions which were being introduced here, which were being introduced to in these sections are going to be important throughout your mathematical careers. Arc cosine, I've been a TA, well, let me, I've been a TA for Calc 2 for the last two semesters, and both semesters I've had to take time to review these inverse trig functions with students, okay? So they're not going away. They are tricky, I understand. But do your best to try and understand them now so that in the future you feel comfortable with them because, <laughs> believe me, the last thing that you want is to be trying to do some really complicated problem and you don't even understand what the functions mean. Believe me, I felt that way all too many times. And believe me when I say it is worth it to just take some time now to make sure that you understand it. Okay, the final problem which we're gonna cover in this video, in episode two, all my E to the X's live in Texas. Oh, I should have written like all my E to the X's live in T to the X's, oh well. Um, is problem 30, and this is a very applied problem. Um, there are a lot of applied problems on this homework, but they work pretty similarly, which is why I'm just going to focus on one today. You also half-life of a certain radioactive. You also know, oh my goodness, I can't write. that I am a pure mathematician, so <laughs> the applied problems aren't quite as interesting to me, probably as they are to you all. Don't get me wrong, they are still so much fun, and I would rather be doing them than, than, than non-math, but still. All right, so we're told the half-life of a certain radioactive substance is 48 hours, and there are 18 grams present initially, present initially 
All right, so there are two parts of this problem. We'll do them piece by piece rather than writing them both out to start. So part A wants to know, express the amount of substance uh, remaining as a function function of time t. And there's an, a, a twist in days. And this is important, in days. This is important because we are given our time in hours. We're given our half-life in hours. So we're going to need to convert that. Thankfully, 48 hours is nice and clean. When we try and put it into days, it's exactly two days. So that is not so bad. So the general form for this type of problem, so the general form, our solution is going to look like y equals y naught times e to the minus kt. Okay, where y naught is our initial value, initial amount. Okay, we'll fill these in in just a second. Um, t. Um, well, actually, let me let me jump to k. So k equals the half equals the. equals ln2 over half-life and t is time. So t is going to be a variable. Variable. Now in this case, why not our initial amount? Let's see, we're given 18 grams. All right, so there are 18 grams initially, so y not equals 18. And k is ln2 over the half-life. Okay, the half-life, we're told, is 48 hours. However, again, we want our answer in days. So we're going to instead write that our half-life is 2. All right. So those are our ingredients. So now let's plug them all back in. Y equals 18 times e to the negative. Okay, so k, so it's e to the negative kt, so negative ln 2 over 2 times t. Okay, and this is this is not incorrect. This is certainly true. But we can do a little bit of simplifying here. So let's write this as 18 times, okay. I'm going to rewrite E as, I'm going to rewrite this part as follows. E to the negative, or actually I can write it this way. The first thing that I'm going to do is I can instead bring this negative, if I give, I can put one over to get rid of that negative. So now I have one over e to the ln two over two times t. Okay, and now this becomes 18 times, well, I can bring out t over 2 and write this as 1 over e to the ln of 2. All of that raised to the t over 2 power. So this part down here, this is because a to the b to the c is equal to a to the bc. Okay, so if I had the exponents multiplied together, I can break them up like this. And so that's exactly what we did down here. I broke up the ln 2 over 2 and the t. Well, actually, the ln 2 
and the t over 2. I've just rewritten them a little bit. And Bailey, why the heck did you take the time to do that? Well, because now e to the ln of 2, that is just 2, right? Because of our e and ln canceling. So this just becomes 1 half to the t over 2 power. And you could further simplify that if you wanted to. Um, but we'll, we'll leave it there. I feel comfortable leaving it there. And that gives us our equation. Okay, so let me, I suppose that I should. Oh, no, I didn't mean to do all of that. Y is equal to all that stuff. That's our equation. Okay. Now, the second part of this problem asks us to find when will there be five grams remaining. When will there be five grams remaining? Well, what we do is set, so we're going to write five equals, so we're going to plug in y equals five, so y equals five. We're going to plug that in, and that gives us five equals 18 times one half times t over two. And now we're going to solve for t. Because what we want is the time. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do, so now we're just going to do algebra this whole this whole whole rest of the way here. So divide both sides by 18, and I get 5 over 18 equals 1 half to the t over 2. Now if I square both sides, then I get uh, 5 squared over 18 squared equals one half one ooh one half to the t okay all I did there was square both sides and now what I can do and this is so remember whenever I had like e to the ln um Oh, what am I trying to say here? What am I trying to say here? I am trying to say, oh, we had like e to the ln of a equals a, right? Well, ln of a, you'll recall, is just the natural is just log base. So this is the same thing as log base e of a equals a. So in other words, if I raise, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm losing my train of thought right now. Oh, right. Simil so, excuse me, this isn't the identity that I wanted. I wanted the opposite direction, in fact. I wanted to use the fact. So that's true what I wrote. But what I want to use is the fact that ln of a to the b, yeah, equals b ln a. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna use that same idea here. I wanna pull that t out front. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take Oh my gosh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. I am struggling to the end here. Struggling, limping to the finish line. Take the natural log of both sides. The natural log of 5 squared over 18 squared equals the natural log of 1 half to the t. Yes, that's what I want. <laughs> All right, these two things are the same, so surely if I take the natural logs, they're still the same. Okay, well then ln of 5 squared over 18 squared, which you could simplify that. 
equals now I can bring this t down front and give me t ln one half. And so if I just divide now both sides by ln of one half, so ln of five squared over 18 squared over ln of one half equals t. Okay, and so we could then simplify, but I'm going to leave it there. If you'd like to simplify, you can. In fact, the problem says to round to the nearest hour, but I'm going to leave you round to the nearest hour as needed, it says. So I'm going to, I will leave that part to you, but this gives us our exact value of t. The trick here was that in order to get the t out of the exponent, right? we wanted to get that t out of the exponent, what you do is you raise both sides to the natural log. Or you take, excuse me, you take the natural log of both sides. All right, that is it for this video. If anybody has any questions or concerns or comments, blah, 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 please send them my way. You can send them to my email. I suppose you can leave them in the comments if you wanted. Um, somebody last time, not anybody in our class, I think some random YouTuber, um, commented um, something about MILFs. Um, and, and there was a link. And I, I followed it because I just, you know, I, I naturally assumed that it meant mathematically, because it was a video about functions, right? So I assumed they meant mathematically interesting interesting and lit functions um, but I was disappointed to see that that was not the case um, but anyways until next time enjoy the rest of your day night whatever time it is and remember kids you can undo e to the x's but you